ברוכים הבאים לפודקאסט של מרכז עומקים להכשרות EMVR. היום אנחנו מתחדדים לארח אחד מהגדולים בעולם טיפול ה-EMVR, מורנו דוקטור רג'ר סלמון. Welcome to the podcast of Aviyom Akim EMDR Training Center. Today we have the distinct honor of hosting one of the premier voices in the world of EMDR therapy, our teacher, Dr. Roger Solomon. For any of the people who might be watching this who don't know uh, Dr. Roger Solomon, um, Roger is one of the early trainers of uh, EMDR uh, from America um, and also from Italy. And... Um, Roger was my teacher when I first did part one, and um, one of the world experts, at least in our opinion, I, I, I hope Roger will agree with that, one of the world experts on, on treating complicated grief um, with EMDR. Um, so we wanted to just have a conversation with you about some of, the, um, some of your insights um, on some of these issues. Um, So, uh, Tuli, you've also been dealing with this a lot with dealing with things in the army. Um, so I really just wanted to have this conversation with the two of you. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to start with? Just an opening statement, Roger, just a, a, a moment of uh, hearing yeah, yes, your take. Uh, yeah. There is. Well, you know, first of all, hello, and you're not alone. The So many of us in the world are with you and thinking of you the so which has been interesting to me that many of my friends all over the world who are not jewish wrote me because i am jewish so you know saying that right. that uh, their heart their heart is with with israel and yeah. of course the, the friends that i do know you know here in the united states in the emdr community of course are very much with you we want to do all we can to to help So that's that's the first thing I would like to say. Mm -hmm. Thank the you. The second general thing I would like to say is that there may be some specific things about grief and traumatic grief that would be important to know. But overall, your experience as an EMDR therapist in dealing with trauma and complex trauma and early childhood attachment trauma is going to come into play here. So I think Absolutely. those of you who are watching this already have a lot of the background and experience that you need to deal with the kind of situations that Israel is now facing. If right. anything, hopefully things that we will, the three of us will be talking about will give you more confidence and just... Uh, enhance your ability to apply mm -hmm. your art. Yeah, thank you. Um, Tuli, is there anything that you wanted to open with that you, before we... I saw that, Roger, if you can talk a bit about grief or complicated grief from an, N, from an AIP perspective. Because basically, I think that when 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 one understands AAP correctly, then you know where you're going. Maybe you will take a left here or a right there, but you'll know what to do with that. And if you if we can get get your your views on on theoretical views on on complicated grief, like in in such a harsh condition, yeah. and right. maybe also another question that comes to mind, and I'm I'm saying that now because it it. It is coming from various places, especially with people that were living next to Gaza all their lives. What do you do with complicated grief when the person to begin with has already PTSD engraved into his, his, his or her system? When the system is already so alert or... or, or I don't know. So before you answer that, I'd, I'd like to go back to, excuse me, to the first question, um, the talking about an AIP perspective on how we might look at grief, both normal grief and complicated grief, um, because some of our listeners might not actually be EMDR therapists per se. I just wanted just to make a, a, a quick note of what we mean when we speak about AIP. Uh, AIP is adaptive information processing. It's the theoretical model 
that is the background of EMDR therapy um, and basically proposes that our, our system knows how to process information and it does it every day, it does it all the time. And there are certain um, types of, of uh, information that comes in that sometimes gets stuck or doesn't get um, processed or processed enough and maybe stored in ways that, that can actually um, prevent people from being able to function the way they'd like to be functioning. Now, what we do in EMDR is that the, the interventions of EMDR tries to kick in the processing system to help people be able to function better. So that's just a, a quick, quick, just a, a few sentences on what we might mean by the word, the words AIP. So as uh, with your expertise, we really wanted to hear how you, you think about normal grief versus complicated grief. Uh, even before you talk about a history of complex uh, PTSD, I was really curious, just, just in the general of talking about this from a theoretical perspective, how you see the difference between normal grief and, and, and uh, complicated grief. So another important aspect of the AIP model is that present problems are the result of past events right. that are maladaptively stored in the brain. Right. So what happens is that uh, we have maybe a history of trauma and loss, and this can get triggered in the present. There's some kind of a reminder, either external or internal, and it starts to trigger it starts to bring up those experiences events that are maladaptively stored in the brain and that impacts present functioning right so now let's let's put this in in terms of uh, specifically loss now so let's define some terms grief is the reaction that we have to a loss psychological emotional behavioral, physical, and spiritual. And there's so many different kinds of losses. So I'm going to make the uh, assumption that we're talking about the loss of a loved one. But let's all uh, let's understand that, particularly now in Israel, there's also the loss of safety and maybe the loss of you know trust and safety in the world. And you know, many, many assumptions about the world, about safety, about oneself have been violated. So there really is a lot of loss, and including for many, loss of community. So yeah. in that sense, everybody has lost something. And there's also, uh, when we talk about grief, I think we can talk about collective grief Two, my first time in Israel as a, uh, a psychologist was in 1995. I had been before in 1970 as a student uh, at uh, summer, summer session, University of Tel Aviv. In, uh, uh, mm -hmm. So, but one of the things I, I learned that the first time is that every student you can probably say every Israeli at that time, every man was a veteran, often of three wars. Every woman, if not if not a veteran, had lost somebody. Everybody had lost somebody. So certainly there's been collective loss, collective trauma. And I think that creates a context too. Now, mourning we can look at the mourning process as an adaptation to the loss. So we have grief reaction to the loss and mourning the adaptation to the loss. And there's a number of, of uh, good frameworks that, that help us understand how a person will traverse through the, the mourning process. But I do want to talk about the difference between, let's call it uncomplicated versus complicated grief. So uncomplicated grief is when we lose somebody, it's going to hurt. It, it feels terrible. It, it's, it's going to be very distressing. We've lost somebody that we love. And we are going to have to adapt to the world. This is mourning. So 
we have to shift from loving the person and presence when they were alive to loving them in absence now that they are dead. So who we are in the world changes. Who am I? And the world changes. What is the world like without our loved one? And our relationship to the deceased changes as well because they're no longer here. Now, something I want to emphasize is that we do not lose the attachment to the loved one. It transforms. All right. All the frameworks and books that you will read tell you that we are able to think of the of the loved one and, and remember them and feeling them with the, the memories of good feelings in our heart. And indeed, this is what happens with EMDR therapy, which, of course, is a natural process that when we have uncomplicated grief, let, let's take that, we can go in and target the impactful moments of realization or like when one heard the news and realized what was happened or the moment of traumatic impact. Maybe it's a hospital scene. Uh, whatever that might be. And a person will start to experience intense emotion, that raw felt emotion that comes with the realization of the loss and the permanence of the loss. Our loved one is not coming back. And the so for, shock for, just for half a second, just to, to clarify, um, again, if I go back just to the theory of the AIP theory. So you're saying in, in normal non-complicated grief, there still are moments that can be targeted that are are may not be processed yet, that EMDR therapy could help that happen. But if I'm uh, if I'm not mistaken what you're saying, it's a natural process that also with very often without therapy, those things would get processed. Um, because that's that's what the processing system does. Uh, yes, I am. That even when uncomplicated, EMDR can be helpful. Yeah. If uh, this is something that comes up in uh, you know training a lot, because I'll yeah. put out there that it uh, can be utilized. I'll give you this example. I, I was doing this training. I think I may have been in London. I'm saying this, and somebody. Uh, you know, raises their hand and say, why are we doing EMDR if it's uncomplicated and the person's going to be able to get through it? And then somebody else, not just raised their hand, they jumped up and they turned around to this person and said, because it hurts like hell. We can, it is still traumatic. It still hurts. And EMDR is a natural process that can facilitate the healing. I have done hundreds of sessions with people who have lost loved ones, mostly the, the survivors of police officers who have been killed in the line of duty, okay? And who are going through uh, a grieving process, but normal. And EMDR therapy has been helpful. And indeed, the follows pretty much the, you know, you know, the same pattern of there's the experience of that raw felt emotion that comes with realization. But then what happens is that positive heartfelt memories and moments start to link in. Now, in terms of AIP, we can think of it this way. The, the trauma can block access to positive adaptive information, which can be the positive memories. A person thinks of their loved one and they're not here. They're gone. Somebody I love is gone. I, I'm alone. I, that connection is gone. And that hurts so much. That connection to the loved one is gone. And once we start to do the processing, again, there will be that raw felt emotion that comes with the realization of the permanence of the loss. Roger, then, you're saying something very, you're saying something one very sec, important. One sec, one sec. Once okay. we were able to do that, then 
adaptive information is able to link in. And this usually takes the form, uh, among other things, of heartfelt, meaningful moments that give the mourner a sense of connection. So this is the transformation of the attachment. We don't lose the connection to the loved one. It transforms, but yes, it will take time. Uh, the, my question um, is from from my experience, not only not not working you know working with complicated grief or complicated loss. In previous previous times, many times people that have lost their loved ones through trauma go into a hectic rush of doing of doing things, commemorating, building, 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 you know, uh, new playground for that person. Or the, they don't, they are not, they don't stop in order to feel and sense the grief. And I think that what you said is very important for us right now, because what you're saying is that the trauma blocks the natural process of processing the loss. Because I have so such intense feelings or or sensations, when the grief is complicated, I'm blocked from my natural resources that can help me deal with the loss. Am, am I right? Did I get you right? Yes, yes, you're 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 right. And yeah. you're saying something else. People start to do something to co commemorate. It's important mm -hmm. to remember. But what can complicate the grief, in fact, we can almost use it as a definition, is the difficulty to realize the permanence of the loss. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have memorials to remember. It's important to have, you know, go to the cemetery, to say Kaddish, to do things to remember, look at photographs, tell stories, but, but what's important is that there has to be at some point, and it doesn't happen right away, it happens gradually, that the loved one you know, is gone and is not coming back. And that can be too much. Now, what, we, what I'd like to suggest what, is that, what I'd like to suggest is that from time to time, people react to complicated grief in an overdoing. Unlike grief like a grandmother that, that passed away in the course of time, we prepared ourselves, we were there. In a complicated grief, traumatic grief, people turn to maladaptively overdoing things, avoiding the ability to, to to be there in the moment. Yes, Arno Vanderhart, our good friend, would call this substitute actions, that the emotions are so overwhelming that they're these substitute actions to deal with it. That's something, very important. Something that's uh, very important to understand is what creates the complication. And this is where AIP model is helpful, you know, past, present, and future. Research has shown that a person's attachment style accounts for the variance and how a person grieves. Okay, this is, this is important. So attachment isn't love. Attachment is safety. And we're born into this world with, with a... Um, an action system, you know, attachment action system to attach to a caregiver for safety. So, and they're going to be, of course, some parents that are good enough. And when the child is in distress, the, the, the parent is able to offer comfort. And there are going to be some parents that are there some of the time and then not there some of the time and sometimes can provide comfort, other times might be critical but that the child is wanting that safety. And when there's, uh, uh, when the, when there's separation, it's, it's, it can be stressful for the child. Where's my parent? Where's my safety? And you know, this, if this happens a lot, this 
leads to the ambivalent anxious attachment style. And when there's neglect, you know, criticism, shaming, and blaming, the best survival strategy is to shut down. This is the precursor to an avoidant attachment style. And when you have a caregiver who is both the source of safety and the source of terror, then we have disorganized attachment style. But our attachment system is activated when there's a lack of safety. And when somebody dies, somebody close to us dies, there's a lack of safety. It, it, our attachment system gets activated. And so it can start to trigger and bring up not only previous trauma and losses, but also these developmental attachment-based memories from childhood. These memories are responses that occurred when there was separation distress. So this is how attachment trauma impacts how we grieve. So in complicated grief, not only do we have the trauma of the loss, I lost somebody I love. First of all, we have traumatic circumstances, sudden, unexpected, intentional, and violent circumstances that can complicate the grief. Loss of a child can complicate the grief. Of course, it's untimely. You know, many of these factors, there's traumatic grief. And then if it's, uh, and then it gets more complicated, of course, when there's previous unresolved trauma, especially from previous wars, previous losses, and then when there is attachment trauma. So this, inter this magnifies the grief response and interferes with the person going through the mourning process. So not only do we have to deal with current circumstances and the trauma of the current loss, but at some point, we also have to deal with these previous unresolved losses, traumas, and including, if I can, uh, you know, the attachment, the attachment trauma as well. So, um, Roger, I'm going to ask you a question that, that I, I, know, I already know the answer, but I know you like giving the answer. Um, how soon is too soon to work with, um, with grief and loss? Um, from, from all right well here <laughs> here of course is where <laughs> israel has taken the lead in the practice <laughs> and the research but i will say this the soonest is when the person is able to experience the emotional impact and stay present and and, and able to able to express it in some way quite often a, a person may be numb a person may be numb. And I've certainly tried to do EMDR when a person is numb. And there's been research in Israel. Uh, I believe Elon Kutz had a conversation with him. What, what did he mm -hmm. do the first day? Nothing worked that first day. They were numb. They were in shock. But within right. a few days, as people started to experience uh, some of the emotional impact, then EMDR was helpful. And uh, Elon Kutz's research is probably well over a decade, may, maybe two decades at this point, in the beginning of um, EMDR therapy. It's come a long way with Gary Quinn, with Elon yeah. Shapiro, and other people and doing the research. So when a person is numb is when they need psychological first aid, chicken soup. Chicken soup, yeah. Yeah, support. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But then at some point, the emotional impact starts to hit. And that's when EMDR therapy can be considered. The per it's, it starts to hit. And the person's able to stay to a good enough level present with it, even just with the, the, the being held in the presence of the therapist can be, can be good enough. And of course, there's you know Gary Quinn's procedures, you know too. There's there's methodologies that can really, uh, yeah. We have control over the pace and the depth of EMDR therapy mm -hmm. and, and how we go in. Right. I think mm -hmm. with so, you know my personal experience, yes, I I have tried doing EMDR you know therapy when people have been numb. And and this is when it, it's uh, nothing uh, I think is going to work. And most recently, my last visit to Ukraine, 
and working with the wife and teenage daughter of a soldier who had been killed and they had gotten the news uh, less than three days before. They were shocked, they were numb, just only starting to take in what was happening. This is where support, normalizing, giving information, caring was very helpful. There are circumstances, you know, however, when even the next day, and I've done this too, the next day, there's such, the, uh, even the same day, there can be such an acute response that the person is present with that doing some of the EMDR recent event protocols can be helpful. So when I've worked with uh, police officers uh, or uh, other professions too, there's there's been a death or witnessing something horrible, witnessing the death of a good friend. And they can't eat, they can't sleep. And, and then maybe the next day, after going through a thorough, you know, talking about what happened, then doing uh, EMDR therapy is very helpful. I also want to cite the experience, I believe, of Alan Cohen, who yes. I, I believe you know. We've, yeah. uh, we've been together at workshops going back 20 years ago. And uh, Alan, you know, would describe being on the is Israeli emergency response team, going to the uh, uh, responding right away to a scene of of some crisis or, or 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 terrorism, and if there were people who were not coping, he was able to provide some bilateral stimulation and start doing some bringing in EMDR elements. To help them cope. I've also. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to ask Roger, are mm -hmm. we actually saying that we are waiting for the person to be in his window of tolerance in order to work with him? Maybe he's outside his window of tolerance because of numbness, or maybe he's outside of window of his window of tolerance because he's too agitated. What we what we want him to, to be is inside the window of tolerance. Well, people go outside the window of tolerance all the time. Yeah, sure. And a lot of, uh, and, you know, theoretically, if a person stays outside the window of tolerance and won't integrate, they go into hyperarousal or hypoarousal. So the, the longer I work, which seems to increase every year as I get older, the more the more I realize the importance of the therapeutic relationship and presence to keep the person there. There are ways, not just with our presence, but ways of slowing things down. So people go outside the window of tolerance all the time. What we have to do is recognize it when they're getting outside and then do some things to bring them back within. And there's a number of different ways to do that. A lot of it is holding the person in our presence. I've had talks with Francine, who, who these were her words. Can you hold this person in your presence? So dyadic regulation is very important. So a person can go outside. They're going through hell. We go through hell with them. That's, that's really very important. So... And uh, the, again, there are some methodologies with EMDR therapy that you know Gary Quinn has developed that I have found very helpful. His emergency procedures that, when a person's outside the window of tolerance, can help bring them back inside the window of tolerance. Right. So here, let's we, let's talk about the difference though between so psychological first aid and utilization of EMDR thera therapeutic elements for psychological first aid, which are gonna be different than the EMDR ther therapy procedures for memory processing. Okay, so we, we can right. use EMDR therapy in, in the, uh, you know, from the very beginning. I think we have to be careful when a person's numb 
though, and that this has been my experience where I've tried, you know, many things. When a person's numb, this is uh, this is where psychological first aid and chicken soup and support and comfort information is going to be helpful. And then as soon as the person starts to experience and is able to tell us about what's happening and, and to some level, stay present with it to some level. But of course, there's things that we can do to keep them within that window of tolerance. Then I, we, then we can help get them through. I'm recalling another example of, of a colleague, uh, a man uh, shot himself in front of his wife and the next day she can't function. So he did the usual things he would do through talking through, wasn't so helpful. She still wasn't functioning. But focusing on the image, adding bilateral stimulation, then the sound, then the smells, some of the sensations, because some physical matter got on her, helped at least calm her so she could start coping, you know, come back, you know, come back to earth and at least start functioning. And then of course treatment can uh, you know continued. So we have EMD, EMDR therapeutic procedures that can be helpful in a uh, very acute crisis intervention. And then as the person is able to experience the loss too, then there's EMDR therapy memory processing procedures that right. we start to use. Right. Yeah, so we've been, uh, I also know that the EMDR Institute has has been focusing on this for the, at least the past decade of bringing back EMD versus EMD small r versus EMDR. Uh, the RTEP procedures use that as well. And we've been finding that that the that making that distinction of what am I trying to accomplish in this moment um, will really guide practice. Um, so you'll have some things that are really just about grounding. It's not about EMD even, it's not even about EMD small r. So with uh, Gary's procedures, just ground present here now, not there. And once you have somebody here, we still might to do a, need to do a lot of desensitization. So then we're going to pull out a lot of the a lot of the things that we do with desensitization when a person is actually within the place of the window of tolerance where reprocessing can occur. That's where we're going into the EMD small R or even EM, regular EMDR um, processing. Well said. Thank you. And very interesting bringing in all the different methodologies right. that develop. So, right. so again, we're making a distinction, broadly speaking, between the crisis intervention methodologies of, you know, EMD right. or even EMD or small r, uh, uh, Gary Quinn's procedures, and then the memory reprocessing procedures. Right. And, of course, this is occurring within the context recurring um, in context, especially in the beginning of psychological first aid, where there's going right. to be safety, comfort, information, connection, and support. I, I have to say in you- Go ahead, can you say those again, since you apparently have them counted down? Oh, you I was watching you do your- remember? Oh, I thought, I thought it was like something you've, you've said a thousand times already. Yeah. You said, <laughs> <laughs> no. So again, the psychological first aid, okay, yeah. safety, you know, safety first. A person's, you know, got to feel safe. Then comfort. So there's food, there's water, there's blankets, some degree of shelter. I also will, respecting dignity too. So keep the press away, you know, you know the gawkers, you know, there can be the appropriate privacy. And then getting some information is important for a major project that we set up in Italy. There's psychological first aid that's available for the relatives, the family members of uh, people that are killed in automobile accidents. Mm -hmm. And one of the people uh, who's part of our group who designed the program is a father who lost his son and he so well articulates that what he really needed was information on what he's experiencing and what he will experience. So information is uh, very much part of that. So, and then connection. Connection is, is so important. Uh, it, it's vital 
Okay. As a matter of fact, the lack of support, being alone is a risk factor. Sure. So connect the family, to friends, uh, other people. What I've seen, again, in, in Ukraine, as I've met and worked with many now widows, uh, that uh, there are their support groups, there are other surviving spouses or widows that will can get there, provide that information and, and support and, and, and say that, yes, it's awful, it's horrible, but things do get better. That sense of community also is very important. The, you know, setting up, and I know Israel has been doing this, a, a center where you list all the people that you know about who, who's alive, who's deceased, where people are, so, you know, using all our technology to help people connect to friends and, and family is, is very important. And then information, too, as to not just about grief and loss, but as to what's happening. And, and giving us, as, as, uh, uh, you know, appropriate information in a timely fashion and in a, in a responsible fashion, in, information also as to, to what's happening. So th these are the elements of psychological first aid. And oh, of course, one other important one is the referral and availability mm -hmm. of appropriate services, whether to, you know, so that can be, right. uh, you know, so many, so many different things, but those yeah. agencies. So, and services so Roger, you just like added a, set, a number of fingers as you went on there. That was very good. Um, not only did you remember what you said, you actually added to it. So thank you very much. I'm glad I asked the question. Um, I'm looking at the clock now, and I think we should start wrapping up now. I'm wondering if you have any like um, last words that you'd like to, uh, um, um, words of wisdom or anything else that you'd like to share with the uh, yeah. with the community here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we it's important to recognize when we, if, um, for the EMDR therapist to recognize when things are starting, you know, the, uh, when, when there is things that are more complicated, you can start going through the assessment phase and you can start to see the person leaving, getting outside their window of tolerance. And you can see that it's too much. And uh, I have videos that I hope to show at some point that that illustrate this. But when we start to see that, there are ways to slow things down. And this is where we need to evaluate, are there feeder memories? What else is being triggered here? So mm -hmm. quite often and wanting to help an EMDR therapist will go right in and start doing EMDR therapy. And the person's getting upset or things are shutting down. When this is happening, it's likely that there are there's other stuff, mishigas, if I can use that term, that's being triggered that needs to be uh, identified, assessed, and and treated. And of course, we should know something about this even before we start EMDR therapy. Not jump right in, but understand what things may be impacting the current loss. So Roger, you just you just hit a button that is a sensitive topic for me. You said that we don't start EMDR therapy, um, but I always thought we started EMDR therapy with taking history. You're right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> You're right. EMDR starts the uh, therapy. It starts the moment the client starts to come in. I should right. say too many people start EMDR memory processing Thank you. therapeutic <laughs> methods without too many people read. history. Yeah. Roger, too after all, I have your students. With yeah. triple technology. Now, the, the, why, why are we talking? Why aren't you waving your finger in front of me? Right, right. Yeah. I read the book. Why aren't you doing this already? My yeah. book comes out in January. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Very good. Okay, so you just plugged it just now. So hopefully we'll all buy copies and you'll come visit Israel and you'll give us and you'll sign our copies of it. Oh. So Roger, I really, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, many of us here in Israel who um, know and love you, um, we've 
we've learned from you. You've always been there for us whenever we needed you. Um, and once again, it's just uh, such, it's uh, first an honor for, for me that you were willing to, uh, to spend some time with us. Um, and, you know, hopefully you will keep on teaching for many, many years, um, because I think you have an awful lot more that you haven't even figured out yet. Yeah. Well, look All forward right. to seeing you both again as soon as we can meet, have another, as we call it, the heart of uh, heart the, of the, the MDR. MDR meeting. Yeah. The magnificent minion. Yeah. There you go. So, okay. Thank you. Thank totally you. Good to see you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Roger. Bye. Bye.